Okay, so um, thank you um, for hanging around and also especially to the people in Europe. Um, thank you very much for staying awake until um, this late hour. Um, so basically I am a deep learning solutions architect for NVIDIA and I'm also transitioning into an AI developer relations role um, for EMEA, which is Europe, Middle East, um, Africa. And um, as you can probably guess um, by the accent, I'm based in Bristol, um, or officially Bristol. I live in the north of England. So my field is artificial intelligence. And um, let me now just flick over to share slides. Right. So as I said earlier, my field is um, artificial intelligence. And um, this talk is on NVIDIA's role and capability in AI, as well as the support that we offer to the, to the community, to you. Hopefully then over the next half an hour, I can explain who NVIDIA are, why we're all over AI, and give you the details on our latest software and hardware. Um, and as I said, once I'm actually finished here, I'll go back and we'll hopefully uh, do some live Q&A. Okay, so just a, um, a brief introduction on NVIDIA. Um, we started out in gaming and 3D graphics, uh, inventing the graphics processing unit, the GPU. Um, even then, in 1999, um, founded 93, but by 1999, we, we brought out the GPU and even then, they offered thousands of calls um, for high speed rendering, but around 2000 developers started to use GPUs for general maths. So we responded with a novel superset of C called CUDA, Compute Unified Device Architecture. Um, more on that later. But this itself led to the renaissance that we now see in, in robotics, intelligent machines and systems and a new way of supercomputing. So GPUs now power the fastest supercomputers in the US, Europe, and Japan. And then uh, top right there, you can see the DGX1, which I'll get to in, the, in a few slides. So quite simply, as we, um, quite simply as, as we digitize more and more units, pretty much everything comes down to mathematics and physics. Once devs realized this, and Ian Goodfellow, who talked yesterday, he was using GPUs a, a decade ago. Um, once word was out, that our GPUs became um, useful, then they also became one of two key elements in the explosion of AI today, especially this subset called deep learning. Um, big data was the other, and we're heading for exascale computing now. That's 10 to the 18 or million terabytes. And the, um, the, the compute intensive tasks that come with that kind of data greatly benefit from the GPU's massively parallel architecture. The neural network pioneers of the 80s and 90s were suddenly able to create larger, deeper networks that could encode much more AI, much more intelligence to understand the real world, to simulate virtual worlds, to simulate the universe itself, um, to provide the tech that you will need to do your best work and to make a really lasting impact on the world. And we're seeing a huge amount of activity right around the world with large amounts of funding being given. Um, and um, as we know, DL is everywhere. So how do we do AI? So for anyone not familiar, to use a GPU, you still need the CPU. And there are no restrictions, um, whether you're using IBM or Power or ARM or x86. So we work with the CPU by approaching the software stack down at the level of C, using CUDA to program the GPU. And there are thousands of cores in each GPU divided into SMs or streaming multiprocessors. These are the, what do the actual work um, and each have their own control units, registers, execution pipelines, caches, um, and it's kernels or parallelized functions that are executed on the GPU as an array of threads each executing the same code by a different paths, but grouped into blocks in a grid. Each block allows cooperation, shares results, shares memory. Um, and I don't really have enough time to get into the real details, but it is massive scale parallel computing. And um, basically because 
because we work so closely with nearly all leading researchers, universities, industry, startups, GPUs became the engine of modern AI. Um, if we're not working with you and you need help, please get in touch. So I'm not going to go into deep learning too deeply because you've had lots and lots of talks this, this whole weekend on specifics of deep learning. Um, but I, what I will say is there's nothing magical about it. It's purely mathematical, massive amounts of matrix and vector manipulation. Um, the, the more we learn about our brains, though, the more we learn about deep learning. Um, I'm particularly driven by the neuroscience side, and there are labs working on machine intelligence from both the computer science and neuroscience ends of the spectrum. And we will meet in the middle or reach the singularity, whatever your view is. As a species, um, we know enough maths and physics now to do this and do this correctly. Um, Pedro Domingos spoke yesterday. Um, he prefers the name representation learning to deep learning. Um, that's because how we learn is by representing anything, any concept, object, person, memory, as patterns of connections. It's a combination of neurons firing one after another, after another, after another in sequence. And if you then assign a value or a weight to each connection to represent its strengths, you have a way to turn it into maths. Deep learning bases structure on patterns in data, not the data itself. That's key. AI is data agnostic, just like the brain is. Um, it uses sparsity, yes, but in general, it's billions and billions of floating point operations, exactly what GPUs were, uh, were built for. But you also need that memory element. It's not all about convolutional neural networks. You need recurrency. As Chris Ola at, um, at Google puts it, our thoughts have persistence. We remember things. So recurrent neural networks came along grasping the, the structure of data dynamically over time to predict the next element. LSTMs, or long short-term memory, by Sepp Hochreiter, um, at the time a PhD of Jürgen Schmidhuber um, of ITSIA, the Swiss AI lab. Um, he spoke yesterday too, um, but basically Sepp solved um, the implementation problems. And um, as it says on the slide, um, analyzing vanishing gradient LSTM basically falls out of this almost naturally. At the same time, um, DeepMind uh, recently introduced wave nets. Uh, these can deal with data down at, right down at the level of the raw waveform. Um, also, um, there's the, the advances that are going on at the moment are just phenomenal. Um, so Jeff Hinton, um, another luminary, just um, advised on a paper with two of his PhDs on a new variety of normalization specifically for RNNs called layer norm. Um, you should check that one out too. Now, I don't actually have time to, um, to go into this, but genetic algorithms or evolutionary algorithms are getting very interesting. They help to speed up convergence, um, super accelerated in code rather than in the genome. Uh, GA, or genetic algorithms, is faster than backprop at finding optimal starting solutions, um, but it can also find new sets of potential solutions much further away in the problem space. Um, Backprop can then take these and rapidly head us to conversion to, to the optimal solution. Um, so why? Why all the fuss? Why, why bother? Um, there are actually so many applications. Uh, we all know about Facebook, um, but in areas like natural language processing, um, giving machines the ability to provide us with insights by simply speaking to it goes way beyond any, any simple Google search. Um, Google just uh, released their Allo app, and I've not yet had a chance to, to fully play with it, but it's, um, it's really speeding along rapidly. And um, I love this quote from Nando um, at DeepMind, that natural language understanding and grounded dialogue systems will revolutionize um, pretty much everything. And as he says here, the impact to business, law, policy making, science, um, will be profound and it will bring us closer to understanding human intelligence. Um, robots too. Uh, we, we all love robots, but we simply need them. Um, they're, they're all over the, uh, the, the internet. There's, there's people coming up with robots um, all around the world, but specifically medically. Um, deep learning in a robot means solving control and path planning on the fly. Um, 
it means that the robot can model uncertainty and rewards for improved decision making. Uh, the Florida Hospital Cancer Institute uses um, the Da Vinci system um, of robotics. I mean, why wouldn't they enhance skilled surgeons with another four robotic arms? So one can hold the camera, the other three can hold traditional um, surgical tools. Keyhole surgery is therefore enabled with precision, with 10 times magnification, enhanced 3D vision. The, the surgeons themselves get haptic feedback. Um, essentially, patients go home quicker, they experience less pain and can get back to work in less time. It's really a no brainer. Um, but the other thing as well, and um, let me uh, just get this going. I'm not sure if you'll hear the audio, but um, this is a video by um, Peter Abiel. Oh, <laughs> it's actually quite loud. Let me turn that down. Basically, I don't know if you can hear me now. I think I need to uh, turn that right down. Yeah, basically, when you, <laughs> I love this music, when you mash together gaming environments um, with something called reinforcement learning, um, you, can, um, you can allow machines to learn in simulated environments, and there's no theoretical limit whatsoever. Um, I've been playing around in a place called Second Life for years now, um, and we haven't realized the infinite possibility yet. So the only input that the machine's been given here is, is joint angles, velocities, and, um, and surface. Um, and it, its only goal is to maximize score. So it's, it's essentially trying by um, learning by trial and error. It's not been told how to do anything. It just needs to learn for it for itself. And then just let me get up to the um, to the next one. So basically, the, the goal for for this one is to learn to go as quick as it can, and it actually goes beyond that. Now, what you're doing essentially is is, is watching a robot learn how to stand up because its only goal here has been to get its head in the highest position possible. And it's not given any other knowledge of how to do that. So just let me, uh, it really gets clever when you start doing that. And then you can also translate this into the real world. Um, we actually posted a blog about this. Um, if you want further info, just go to NVIDIA and, uh, and Google deep reinforcement learning. Um, and of course, we all know about um, AlphaGo. You know, basically we can learn from AI. Um, we, we just can't compete with the logical capability of thousands of GPUs and TPUs in this case, so that's Google's tensor processing units. Um, but we don't have to compete. Um, we can use them to improve our game. And that's whatever our game is, like self-driving cars. Um, with NVIDIA's Drive PX and PX2 now, uh, with Parker and our next gen 64-bit Denver paired with um, ARM cores, um, we, we can do some pretty amazing things, but look out for Robo Race. Um, note that there's no seat on that car. It's an all autonomous F1, and that's coming to the screens sometime soon. So here's how we actually enable you. So on top of our hardware lies the full SDK, and that's all the software that you'll need. All open source, all aligned with major frameworks, um, which are essentially the building blocks for working with neural networks. And CUDA um, and our uh, SDK drives everything um, across computer vision, speech, natural language processing, um, as I mentioned, all the major frameworks. And I'll drill down into some of these for, um, to give you a little bit more detail. So QDN is our library of highly optimized GPU accelerated primitives and functions. So that's CUDA for deep neural networks, DNN. Um, they're capable of accelerating FFT and sparse matrices, and again, aligned with the major frameworks. We're working to change that to all frameworks, but there are currently, I believe, 67 at the moment, um, probably a few more since I was given that number. Um, QDNN version 5 currently offers support for RNN LSTM, um, and version 5.1 adds um, optimization for VGG Oxford style. Um, and the very deep ResNet networks. Um, again, everything's optimized for Pascal, our newest architecture, um, with improved um, performance of 3D convolutions, which essentially accelerates any domain using volumetric data. Um, and that, of course, is especially medical. 
Um, Digits is our deep learning GPU training system. Now this allows you to um, basically see what you're doing. Um, it's simply an excellent GUI and a data management system that allows you to interact with the system you're creating. And there's no one size fits all for neural networks. It involves a lot of tweaking and Digits helps you see what you're doing. So that's functionality to process, configure, monitor, and visualize. Um, hopefully you can actually see this, yeah. So basically when I was researching DL, um, so this was at the beginning of 2015, um, they hadn't actually released Digit. So I was basically you know, doing what everybody else was always doing, which is just command line, and, um, and hoping for really great inputs, um, which at the time Torch was, was sending out. But when, when Digits was released, this really brought it all home for me because you can actually see um, it, at certain layers, it, it doesn't really make much sense, but you know, we're, we're gradually opening up the, uh, the black box. So Digits 4, um, I can't believe we're already at 4, um, now offers object detection um, and our newest neural network, DetectNet, which actually comes pre-trained for you to use. Um, and you can, so basically you can now both locate and define bounding boxes using coordinates of the corner of the image. Um, again, there's a, a great blog post online. Um, and I think the fact that we're, we're now at digits 4.0 and QDNN 5.1 already shows the, the, the speed of this field, the, the speed of deep learning progression since only last year. Um, and again, it, it was only 18 months ago, I suppose, that the, that the world really started seriously looking at using GPUs, but that then rapidly became using multiple GPUs. So to address latency issues, we also developed Nickel. So that's um, NVIDIA's collective communications library. It's open source. Um, go use it. Go play with it. If you're familiar with MPI, the parallel programming, then this is the GPU optimized version of that. Um, NVIDIA uh, MV Graph which is our offering for, for graph analy analytics. That will be available with q 8 very soon. It's a library that both accelerates and makes it a lot simpler to use graph analytics, which is a way to map relationships between huge amounts of entities. Again, more, more information online. So we, we now have this new computing model, high dimension um, optimization um, and throughput is um, is actually a major area of our own internal research um, essentially larger batch sizes utilize the gpu cores much more efficiently but this does have a trade-off to accuracy within the training phase but regardless whether you're in academia or a research lab um, or in industry the amount of time and power it takes to complete inference of the actual predictive capability is the most important consideration for a deep learning application since this determines both the quality of the user experience and the cost of deploying the application. So having an energy efficient, high throughput application is critical. So we introduced the DeepStream SDK um, to accelerate specifically intelligent video content analysis, which is essential for self-driving cars, for interactive robots, filtering, ad placement. Um, Basically, AI is hard, um, but it's even harder when it's, it's live streaming video. And um, DeepStream simplifies this with deep learning in a simple C++ API, and it's powered by TensorRT, which rapidly optimizes, validates, and deploys a trained neural network. Um, pipelined in from digits, if you want, um, but essentially it's for, for inference to data centers, embedded, or automotive platforms. TensorRT is performance tuned for GPUs, so it maximizes inference throughput. Um, it uses in 8 and FP16 reduced precision to triple performance, um, and of course, it uses much less memory. Uh, so, okay, um, I'll go through um, hardware and the, the fact that we have this end to end um, family of products, which um, is so we can cover all different angles of the field. Um, so, Titan X Pascal. Um, as um, I'm sure you're all aware now, uh, was recently um, brought out to the world. Um, I mean, as it says, the ultimate developer's workstation. So it's capable of 11 teraflops and it has 12 gigabytes of memory on board. Um, it's 
basically slashed training time again um, compared to um, its predecessor in the uh, in the Maxwell architecture. We also just demoed uh, the Pascal versions of our hyperscale cards in um, in Beijing with um, 90 streaming video simultaneous action analysis um, showing off DeepStream and TensorRT that I just mentioned. You can actually go online to, to see that, just Google NVIDIA DeepStream. And um, the cards that, um, that power that are the new Pascal P40, so that's the 250 watt um, card that gives four times the performance boost on Maxwell. And it's inference counterpart, the P4, which is only 50 watts. And this is designed for max density, power efficiency, space efficiency, um, basically operating at low swap size weight and power. It gives 40 times more efficiency than CPU and also eight times more efficient than, uh, than FPGA. But it all pretty much comes down to Pascal. And this is the biggest leap we've made across chip generations ever. Um, it combines five major breakthroughs, packing five, 10 or 20 teraflops in either double, single or half precision with increased capability from HBM2 stack memory and our NVLink interconnectivity, which enables simply faster iterative progress on um, algorithms, applications across the board. So in summary, um, Pascal now enables a stunning 65 times speed up in training and P4, 40 times speed up for inference in this new computing arena that we have. And for those who can't afford an entire data center, we put eight Pascals into a server for you. And this is our DGX1. So along with upgrades to CUDA, of course, um, CUDA 8 is already on board, plus all the software that you need to do state of the art AI. And I've got an animation here for you. Bear with me. Just to give you a little bit more detail and a, an inside look on the DGX1. So it actually has seven terabytes of SSD storage on board. And there are four separate PSUs, power supply units, to actually power it. There are a total of 28,672 cores on board um, connected with NVLink and the, um, the animation should, should show you a bit more about that. There are also two 20 core Xeons, um, 512 gigabyte, and you can attach it to any NFS and it comes preloaded with software in secure NV Docker containers, that's a fork of, of Docker that we put together specifically for, uh, for DGX1. The um, NVLink is, um, has a hybrid cube mesh that allows almost unlimited memory and gets us closer to strong scaling and is essentially equivalent to 250 CPU servers. So that's the, the DGX1. And as I mentioned, the DGX1 comes preloaded with, um, with qualified containers that use our NV Docker fork um, to, to simply make things a whole lot easier for you. Um, all, the, um, all the support and the, um, and the software um, are available there in, in cloud-based you can take it as a base OS, or you can um, sign up for the actual cloud management, which makes things much easier for uh, for updating. Um, and that I'm, I'm seeing so many different kinds of um, of applications now. But at the other end of the scale, we also have TX1 soon to be upgraded um, for embedded devices, um, powering our automotive products too. So this is a credit card size package of one teraflop performance at less than 10 watts. And I'm seeing all kinds of applications, um, including working with NASA for planetary defense from asteroids, believe it or not. Um, it's a really fascinating area with what's going on in the embedded world. 
Um, again, all support and software for TX1 is online. Um, and Jetpack 2.3 was just released. So this supports a ton of stuff, including um, ROS, the robotics operating system, um, SIC LiDAR, um, Intel's WheelSense, Point Grey, and a lot, a lot more. Um, everything's on, on Ubuntu. So you can essentially go get the dev kit and the, uh, the TX1 online. Um, but it's all designed to, to simply make it a nice, easy iteration, um, easy transition from prototyping to, um, to deployment. So, okay, I'm just gonna wrap up now. Um, everything software-wise is online. Um, the, the entire NVIDIA SDK is all together in one place now. Um, sign up so that you can get early access. Sign up um, via developer.nvidia.com. There's also a ton of, of resources, including online classes that you can, um, that you can get access to. Just go again to developer.nvidia.com or just Google NVIDIA Deep Learning. Um, tomorrow I fly to Amsterdam to join all my colleagues there because we have our um, GTC Europe. So if you can, join us or literally come join us. Come do your life's work. Thanks very much for listening. So I'm now going to hop back over to, um, to the chat and hopefully we can, um, we can do some Q&A. Right. Okay, I'm just going to scroll down now and I'll, I'll read out any questions and try and answer them. Okay, Lou says, where do you see the, um, where do you see the, the future of gaming going? Are there any new features that you're excited about? Um, to be honest, NVIDIA is a huge company and probably the only department that I don't have a lot to do with is gaming. So I can't really, uh, I can't really speak um, with too much expertise there. Um, but it's definitely going to be um, VR and AR, so virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, it won't just be, you know, looking at a, at a 2D screen anymore. We're, we're literally going to be, I mean, we're already seeing things like, um, you know, with, with Connect that, that we're actually up and, and about and, and using um, gloves and things like that. So it'll just get better and better and better. But I think it will also um, go into um, offices as well so that people don't necessarily have to get on a plane and, and travel around the world to just go to a meeting. They can just go into a, a VR or AR environment. Thanks for your question, Lee. Okay, where is your research focus most? Um, okay, so you, I'm going to assume here you, you mean NVIDIA. Um, we do research on a whole lot of different things. Um, so there's a, a, lot of, a lot of research on automotive. Um, right now there's a lot of research in, in core deep learning and, uh, and machine learning techniques and also in the, in the algorithms, um, especially Winograd and um, just speeding up um, and as I mentioned before, throughput as well. Thanks, PJ. Um, I liked you're not afraid of competitors, but how do you take their knowledge and improve it? Um, it it's actually a really great field um, and competition is, is really vital. And um, without competition, nobody would strive to, to do anything better. So, um, it's it's good and, and we work closely. You know, we we we, we all know. I, I personally know all the Nirvana guys, and you know, it's really great that Intel's bought them. Um, so we do work very closely, surprisingly, with um, with a, a lot of people that are considered competitors, um, and and that's good. That's good for everyone. Okay, Davy says, do you see um, a match between? AI and VR, AR, definitely. Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you saw in the video, um, that there's a lot more actually. If you, um, I think what I forgot to say is that that video is um, just an indication of what's capable um, from OpenAI's offering of Jim, um, dot openai uh, dot com, I think it is. So you can actually go on there and you can play around in gaming environments. Unity 3D, I was, um, I was coding, and. Um, 
virtual robotics in, in Unity 3D back in, um, let's see, 2013. Um, and that's really good. So literally you just have a scripting interface and you can link that to a Microsoft um, Xbox controller or something like that. And it just makes it really easy at the end of the day if a robot falls over in a, in a gaming environment on a screen, it doesn't cost anything. Um, as you've seen, I'm sure, from all the DARPA videos, um, you know, it's kind of excruciating when your multi-million pound robot falls over. Um, but yeah, there's a definite mesh and, and we're doing lots. So again, um, we, we have a, a huge um, division that's purely on um, virtual reality and AI is, is all over it. Um, I think, sorry, there's one more question from John. How about NVIDIA and Tesla? Um, yeah, again, it's a very close relationship. Um, I can't say any more than that. Okay, so no more questions, but um, feel free to um, to email us. And sorry about the delays earlier. I hope this was of use to you. Um, you can get in touch. You can get in touch online. Um, my email's um, alounds at nvidia.com or just get in touch um, via the website.